Roger. So Roger was a uh, co-author on the first paper that Josh published, where you cannot pause. And so Roger developed this. I first met Josh more than 50 years ago. I was a postdoc at Tufts, and he was an undergraduate at Harvard. It was ludicrously obvious how bright he was. And I was looking for an assistant for that summer to help me with some research that I was doing on the directionality of the ears of not to moths. The ears of moths are on the sides of their bodies, not on their heads. My PhD dissertation had been on how owls locate mice in total darkness based just on hearing them make noises. And then I went after I worked with Josh at uh, Tufts that I went on to Rockville University where I started working on whales. I'm not going to talk about that at all today, but I wanted to find out how moths determine the direction from which a bat is approaching. And the insect physiologist Kenneth Roder at Tufts had shown that when not to it moths hear bat cries, that they have three different things which they can do. Um, these three different things are dependent on the distance that the bat is from the moth. For example, if a bat is relatively far away, say more than 30 meters, the moth turns and it takes a course directly away from the moth. I mean from the bat, flying fast, the bat, the bat, the, the moth does that, sorry. If a bat is closer, say 10 meters or around that distance, the moth makes a downward spiral into the ground. But if a bat is right on top of a moth, less than five meters, let's say, the moth power dives into the ground. The thing that fascinated Josh and me was that not to moths hear the ultrasonic echolocation pulses that bats make. They recognize that there is something that has to be avoided. They gauge the distance to the bat, and they also get a good idea of its direction. And they make an appropriate maneuver to avoid it. And moths do all of this using the information that comes from a total of just six sensory cells, three in each ear. Each ear has two acoustic sense cells that fire in response to the ultrasonic cries of bats. And they also, and these cells have different sensitivities. They're called the A1 and the A2. The A1 is much more sensitive than the A2, about 20 decibels more sensitive. And um, there's also in the ear, the third cell, the EGL ear, the B cell as it's called, it tends to fire uh, synchronously, sorry, uh, spontaneously and relatively constantly, and its function was a mystery from that when Josh and I started working on these on moths. Kenneth Reuter first worked with a wonderful man named Nasher Tree who was a virtuoso French horn player, among other things. He had to turn down an offer from the Boston Symphony to play first chair French horn. And he did so that, so that he could work on, wait for it, moth ear mites. Tree had discovered that this group of mites infects the ears of moths, that, you know, those species that possess ears. For example, the Nantua moths, the geometric moths. His description of the behavior of these mites was really enchanting. They were gripping. They were even captivating. Treat was one of the best lecturers I've ever heard, and since I wanted to have Josh's help, having worked for me in the summertime, I knew that if Josh heard Asher Treat lecture, that Treat would captivate Josh, and I would benefit by having Josh's help. And indeed, Josh did, Treat did, and I did. Josh told me that when he attended Treat's lecture, that he was enthralled by the description of how mites infest a moth. They wait for their host in a flower, and then they board the moth by walking along the gangplank of its tongue while the moth is feeding on the flower's nectar. Having reached the moth's mouth, the mite clambers up the moth's cliff-like forehead and pushes its way through a forest of tall, fur-like scales covering the moth's head to a mite near about his eye, as an elephant's eye is to us. And then, without hesitation, the mite forces its way ever onwards through the shorter grass, let us say, along the midline of the moth's thorax, to a point which is directly above the moth's ears. And here, the mite pauses for a long time. 
And here, Josh reported, Asher too paused as well. We all waited, said Josh, with bated breath to see what the mic would do next. <laughs> After thinking it over for a while, the mic finally moves. It turns and makes a direct descent down the steep, grassy flank of the moth and into the cavern of the ear that is on that side. It is in the moth's ear that the mic makes its permanent home. The ear has three chambers of it besides the main entrance one, and these the mites turn into a nursery for their eggs, a uh, toilet for their feces, and a larder for their food. The food, alas, being the flesh of the moth, specifically the tissues of the moth's ears. The mite meals eventually deafen the moth in that ear. But the best was yet to come, Josh said. Mites that board the same moth after arrival of the founding pioneer mite never take up residence in the moth's other unoccupied ear. They apparently follow a chemical trail that was laid down by the pioneer mite and to treat guests. The long pause between ears may be the moment when the first mite leaves its chemical directions for any possible follower. Moth ear mites are killed along with their host moth in cyanide jars that moth collectors use to dispatch their specimens. Josh said that Treat knew this and that he'd taken advantage of it by visiting the insect collections all over the country where he looked into the ears of long dead nocturnal moth specimens. Out of about 2,600 moths Treat examined, he found that only one had an infection in both ears. It was clear that even though humans may be blind to what is going on in the world of moth ear mites, that evolution is not, and that mite populations that limit their feeding to just one ear do very vast, vastly better than those that do not. When Josh heard that mite populations can sometimes build up to seeding cords all in one ear, but that there are never any in the other ear of that same moth, he commented, I can just imagine the mites chewing their way through the tube, a dividing membrane between the two ears, with stopping and looking longingly at the light filtering <laughs> into that other pristine, unchewed, cavernous chamber, thinking, one taste, just one taste. Why can't I have just one taste? <laughs> what Josh and I did that summer in the early 60s was to affix a moth to the tip of a wire tower 30 inches high. Yeah. This, it, which stood on a turntable inside an anechoic chamber. The turntable rotated the tower in the horizontal plane and we broadcast sounds to the moth in the vertical plane through a loudspeaker, which you see, sorry, right there. You could turn it and then spin the moth around. And from the time as we turned it, um, we would direct sounds to the moth from any point on the surface of the sphere while varying the intensity of the ultrasonic pulse so that is to obtain a constant number of action potentials from per pulse from the A1 cell of the ear we were testing. This gave us a sphere of what we call acoustic sensitivity for the one. The electrodes that held the tympanic nerve sorry, passed through a tiny glass tube that penetrated the moth's body wall and plugged into a stainless steel uh, uh, saline-filled cup. So the, you can see the electrode coming down through here and through this and it plugs into this little cup which is full of saline. And served, that served as the active electrode. The whole preparation was remarkably strong. You could hit the tower with enough force to produce a vibrational amplitude of about an inch which made the whole moth's body just look like a blur. Yet the preparation continued to produce normal action potentials in response to our sound stimuli. And this robustness, which we had never thought would be possible, allowed us to discover the function of that mysterious B cell. We took an intact moth that was beating its wings vigorously, and we held it next to the preparation and let the wings uh, bash the wings of the, the moth preparation up and down, which they did at flight frequencies. And the B cell, the preparation, immediately began firing one action potential for each of the beat. It was clear that in flight, the B cell could provide wing position information that the moth's nervous system might use to tell where the wings are at the top or the bottom of the stroke. This is important because when the wings are at the top, they interfere minimally with the acoustic directionality of each ear. 
but when it's the bottom, they shave both ears acoustically. And this is because the ear openings are beneath the moth's wings. So, we've got, sorry, wrong button. Here we go. In this slide, the moth is flying towards you with its wings raised at the angle shown. So there's the moth with its wings up here, they're a little further down, here they're way down. And these, uh, the shades of gray, show areas of equal sensitivity in five decibel steps. The darker the shade, the less the sensitivity of the ear being tested to sound from that direction. Latitude and longitude lines indicate the positions from which the speaker projected sounds at the wall, and they're shown here in a Mercator projection. So, uh, note that when the wings are up, the sensitivity of this, since the left ear, is asymmetrical left and right. So the wings are up in this case, and you see it appears far less well on the left side than it does on the right, the left of the wall, that is. Uh, in, as the wings come down, however, you can see that the sensitivity now changes so that the ears are hearing much less well from above than they are from below. But there's no real left-right sensitivity in that one ear. But then you ask the question, that means, sorry, that <clears throat> to escape a distant bat, all a moth has to do is to search for any heading, you can do it randomly if it likes, that keeps the sound intensity as constant as possible in the A1 cells in both ears throughout the full wing strip. The heading that does this best is when the ball is headed directly away from the bat. But what about bats at medium and very close distances? If a distant bat excites just the more sensitive A1 cells, a very close bat will excite both the A1 and the A2 cells in both ears and set them to firing constantly. If A1 cells elicit turns, this is what Josh and I guessed, and A2 cells elicit dives, when a moth is at an intermediate distance from a bat, its A1 cells are both firing and they're telling it to turn. But as it turns, A2 cells will be taking it in turns to fire. In other words, first one in one ear and then the other as the bat ear faces towards the bat. Thus, the brain of the moth gets a constant command from each ear to dive and an intermittent command from each ear to turn. Josh and I imagined that this might explain the moth's section. Second option, it's spiraling ground with the dive to the ground, which is a mixture of turning and diving. But enough already with that, so pause. When I was at Tufts, I had developed a two-year double-intensive introductory course for bio majors that combined the first full years of physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. I wanted biology students to understand that the, the value of having a career in biology if you knew a little physics, chemistry, and mathematics. When we studied vision in this course and photosynthesis, the chemistry professor taught students about the effects of light on, chem on chemicals and how chlorophyll, for example, is involved in photosynthesis as well as how rhodopsin is involved in vision. The physics professor well, would then teach a section on light and the mathematician would teach the mathematics necessary for the students to understand the formulas that they were getting from the physicists. One of the students in the first year of the course went on to an extremely distinguished career in developmental biology in which she studied how growing optic nerves find their way to the appropriate brain areas. Some of her experiments involved excising the primordia of optic nerves and implanting them at inappropriate sites on the head of, the, uh, of a frog. She was once lecturing at a meeting where Josh was also in attendance when she mentioned that one of her frogs had one of her uh, preparations in one of them, sorry, one of the optic nerves had grown all the way down its spinal cord and ended up near its rear. Uh, at this point, Josh said in his not so soft stage whisper, ah yes, a long sought for retino anal projection. <laughs> it cracked the place up. One of the things I loved the most about this guy was his marvelous way of participating in and developing any argument of which he was a part. The emphasis he gave to his words and the force of his accompanying gestures. But the best part always came in Josh's participation when he began to warm to his subject and to elaborate on themes that had not yet received serious attention during the argument. 
The example of this that I recall best came, not surprisingly, at my expense, richly deserved, I might add. Josh knew that even though I was born here and raised in New York City, that I could never get out of this town and into the peace of what I call authenticity of the country life fast enough. He wrote me for worrying too much about the perils and the shallow values I saw in city life. One time, about 30 years ago, we were traveling up from lower Manhattan by subway. We were sharing a car with a guy who looked to me like a mother stabbing father raper if ever there was one. <laughs> and when he got off, I said to Josh, my God, Josh, I wouldn't want to meet that guy in the dark alley. Yes, said Josh, while pointing to the fire extinguisher in our car. And then he added, you know, of course, that that fire extinguisher might slip out of its holder and fall onto your head while you're sitting underneath it, and that could kill you. And then he, I said, that's absurd. And Pop Josh said he was on a roll, but by now he went into a warp drive, and he said, the trouble with living in New York City is that there are so many people in this place that no matter how absurd your worries are, if you stay here long enough, you will eventually see them come true. <laughs> and when they do, you are bound to feel that your fears have been justified all along. By now, he was warming to his subject, and at this point, he really took off. Suppose, he said, that you were afraid of one-legged grandmothers from Madagascar. He said, for years, you read the paper every morning, and then, one day, sure enough, there it is on the front page of the New York Times. One-legged grandmother from Madagascar goes crazy in Times Square, kills three innocent passers-by. <laughs> he made his point. I felt chastened appropriately. I shall miss you, Josh. More than words can wield the matter to borrow a line from Shakespeare. So, Josh, I send you deep admiration and affection in long, slow waves ever